Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight we're going to start out with Sally Ride. And Sally Ride was important because she was the first female American astronaut. Sally Ride died recently at the age of 61. She joined NASA in 1978, and she went into space on the Challenger space shuttle in 1983. She wasn't the first woman in space. The Soviets were actually fairly far ahead of the United States in females in space. Valentina Tereshkova went into space in 1963. So the United States was 20 years behind in getting a female into space. Sally Ride had a profound effect on the American space program in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Here is Diane Sawyer with a discussion of Sally Ride. A true American pioneer died today of cancer. Sally Ride, the first American woman to fly in space, it was nearly 30 years ago. There was towering pressure on her to perform every maneuver perfectly, and she did, proving that women were also born with the right stuff. Here's ABC's Lindsay Davis. When Sally Ride blasted off into space back in 1983, liftoff of SPS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. She not only boldly went where no other American woman had gone before, at 31, she also became the youngest American ever in space. I guess that I was maybe more excited about uh, getting a chance to fly early than I was about getting to be the first woman. The stars all seemed to be aligned. Ride was a Ph.D. physics student at Stanford when she saw a Help Wanted ad in the college newspaper, an ad that would change her trajectory. It said NASA was looking for scientists to work on a new project. It also happened to be the same year NASA started accepting women into its astronaut training program. Of 8,000 applicants, 35 were chosen, six were women, and Ride was the one tapped to go to space on the Space Shuttle Challenger, prompting a flood of media coverage. It's a real experience and uh, the experience of a lifetime to be able to, to fly in space and fly aboard the Space Shuttle, and I have to admit that I'm more excited about that opportunity than I am about being the you know, as you say, a footnote in history. Sally Ride ultimately took the trip twice on the Challenger in back-to-back -back years. Her third flight was canceled after the disaster in 1986, but she went on to inspire young women to consider careers in science. Her example alone encouraged women everywhere to shoot for the moon. Lindsay Davis, ABC News, New York. She was 61, and this is what her official NASA biography says of the first flight. In an instant little girls learn that even the sky wasn't the limit. That's a nice report, even if there are a couple too many cliches in there, to boldly go, shoot the moon, sky's not the limit. In any event, Sally Rye was a remarkable human being. Not only was she a brilliant physics student at Stanford, but she was also a national class tennis player. She came out of Southern California and Sino, and she was one of the top tennis players in California. And in fact, she ran into Billie Jean King when she was in her teens, and Billie Jean King encouraged her to go on the tennis circuit, but Sally Ride realized that her forehand wasn't strong enough, and so she opted for Stanford instead. As the report said, she majored in physics at Stanford, answered a newspaper ad, and everything developed from that. Here she talks about what it was like being the first American woman to go into space. The fact that I was going to be the first American woman to go into space carried huge expectations along with it. And that was made pretty clear just the day that I was told I was selected to the crew because I was also taken up to Chris Kraft's office, who was the head of the Johnson Space Center, because he wanted to have a little chat with me and make sure that I knew what I was getting into before I um, agreed to be on the crew. <laughs> but I was so dazzled just by the opportunity to be on the crew and go into space that I really don't remember very much of what he, what he said. On launch day, there was so much excitement and so much happening around us in the crew quarters, even on the way to the launch pad, going up the launch pad, you know, looking up and seeing, you know, this huge, you know, rocket that kind of sounds like an animal. You can kind of hear the gurgling and the hissing and, you know, it sounds like it's alive. I spent an enormous amount of effort just trying to stay focused. Try to, I tried to block out pretty much everything that was going on around me and just kind of put one foot in front of the other because it would have been way too easy to just be lost in the in the moment. I didn't really think about it that much at the time um, because I just wanted to get the opportunity to do that. 
but I've, uh, I came to appreciate what an honor it was to be selected to be the, the first woman to get a chance to go into space. She rode twice on the Challenger in 1983 and 1984. She was scheduled for a third ride, but the Challenger disaster in early 1986 prevented her from going up again. She left NASA the next year in 1987. She became a physics professor at UCSD. Interestingly enough, she was part of the investigation team that investigated the Challenger explosion. You can find out that whole story if you listen to our podcast on Roger Beaujolais, who died earlier this year. Roger Beaujolais, if you'll remember, also got shunned by a lot of people when he came forward, and Sailor Ride was one of the only people who took sympathy with him and understood his plight when he sort of blew the whistle on Morton Thiokol. She was also on the panel that investigated the Columbia explosion, so she was the only person who was on the investigation panel for both space shuttle disasters. She won many awards. She's in the Astronaut Hall of Fame, the National Women's Hall of Fame, the California Hall of Fame, and she's also written a number of books encouraging children to study science and study physics. So Sally Ride is definitely someone who has changed our culture. She should be recognized as one of the groundbreakers in American science and American space travel. When I was a little girl, I always dreamed of flying in space. And amazingly enough, I still can't believe it to this day, uh, that dream came true for me. Now it's up to all of us to ensure that this generation of students in school today has access to a high quality education so that the boys and the girls can build the foundation that will enable them to reach for the stars and achieve their dreams too. We're going to move on now to Sherman Helmsley, or as he's better known, George Jefferson. Sherman Helmsley died recently at the age of 73, and he was the actor who played George Jefferson on the Jeffersons for many years in the late 70s and early 80s. And he was a groundbreaker in the sense that he changed race relations. The Jeffersons was a spin-off of All in the Family. Now, All in the Family, of course, was the early 70s show that changed race relations in the United States with the portrayal of Carol O'Connor as a bigot, Archie Bunker, uh, a lovable bigot, but a bigot nonetheless. And their next-door neighbors were black, and they were the Jeffersons. Sherman Elmsley played George Jefferson, who was sort of the mirror image of Archie Bunker in that he was a black bigot. Norman Lear wanted to portray both races in their most unflattering yet lovable lights. And so George Jefferson was sort of the black bigot to mirror Archie Bunker's white bigot. And here they are in one of their first appearances together. Hi. It's down. Oh. No, no, I ain't looking for that. No, uh, I don't know. Do I look like a note? Where were you two? I don't know. Oh, so nice. Thank you. Come on, Archie. Yeah, I know. Where are you from? Oh, they are over at our house picking up some records. Oh, that's All right. Nice. Now, can I introduce you to everybody? Oh, I want to tell you the truth, Mr. Shane. Or would I... you rather have a drink first? That's the guy I want to meet the bartender. <laughs> oh, look. Hello, Mr. Jefferson. Oh, hi, Mrs. Bunker. Hey, Jefferson there. How are you? Listen, that uh, formal invitation you sent by your wife, uh, I think that was very white of you. That's exactly the way I felt when I did it. Uh, George, why don't you take Archie over to the bar and offer him a drink? Hey, Jefferson, I seen you hosing down your porch yesterday. Oh, yeah? When am I going to see you hosing down yours? (laughs) Bartender? Yes, sir. Give the man a drink, please. What'll it be, sir? Uh, whiskey. Any particular brand? Yeah, the expensive brand. What about you, sir? Scotch and soda, please. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, Jefferson, there's a switch for you. This guy giving you the big yes, sir. Why, right, he's a partner, then. Yeah, but what I meant was I'm used to having it the other way around. Oh, yeah? How many servants you got in that mansion you living in? Uh, what do you mean by that? Let me tell you something about people. There you are. Thank you. That bartender is willing to work for me because if you got enough green in your pocket, then black becomes his favorite color. Sherman Helmsley played that Jefferson character over the top. I thought a little too much over the top. But in real life, he was nothing like the uh, loud, brash character that he played. He'd come from the New York stage, and he was something of a hippie, a quiet, sort of reserved hippie. It was very interesting that uh, he took an opposite tack, just like Carol O'Connor did in playing Archie Bunker. You know something, Wendell? I don't like you, if you know what I mean. Ah! Look. You rude to my customers. Hey, idiot! 
You're rude to my employees. They're idiots. <laughs> and you're even rude to me. <laughs> okay, Wendell, I'm going to give it to you straight. Ain't no easy way to do this. I've given you every break. I've bent over backwards. I'll give you a chance, and you let me down. So it's all going to end right here, right now. It's over. Well, got anything to say for yourself? Everybody <laughs> like that. I'm trying to fire the guy, and he falls asleep. <laughs> Wendell, get out. It's over. It's through. You're finished. You are dead. <laughs> you are dead. <laughs> hey, 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 Wendell, look, that was just a figure of speech. <laughs> Wendell, please <laughs> You hear him call for Wheezy there. That's Louise Jefferson. That's his wife. She was played by Isabel Sanford. And it's a mark of what good actors they were. Isabel Sanford was actually 21 years older than Sherman Helmsley, but you never noticed it on the show. It never became an issue. In any event, the Jeffersons was mid-late 70s stuff, and it showed that there was an emerging black middle class in the United States. They were no longer portrayed in the ghetto all the time. They were portrayed as middle class, and in some ways, this paved the way for the Cosby middle class blacks of the 1980s. And of course, you can't leave the Jeffersons without that famous gospel theme song that introduced the show every week. It was called Moving On Up. It's about how the Jefferson moved from the lower middle class to the upper middle class. It was performed by Jeanette Dubois, who was a regular on Good Times. And she also wrote it. She was a nice black girl from Brooklyn. And she wrote it with a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn. Jeff Berry was a big rocker who was from Erasmus Hall High School. This was one of the best theme songs of the 1970s. So we say goodbye to Sherman Helmsley with the theme song from the Jeffersons performed by Jeanette Dubois. Well, we're moving on now. Close tonight with Frank Pearson. And Frank Pearson was an eminence grease in Hollywood. For over 50 years, he worked in Hollywood as a screenwriter, a producer, and a director. Frank Pearson died recently at the age of 87, and he is best known for his screenwriting credits on Cat Baloo, Cool Hand Luke, and Dog Day Afternoon. He was born of wealthy parents in Chappaqua, New York. His parents were portrayed in the film, Roughly Speaking, a 1945 film with Rosalind Russell and Jack Carson. He went off to Harvard, he got a degree in cultural anthropology, and he was noted for his ability to synthesize characters. He knew human nature. He started out in television. I'll talk about his first television gig in the 50s in a little while. He went on to television to do Route 66 in the early 60s, a very good program, and then he went to the movies. He did Cat Baloo in 1965, where he fleshed out the character that Lee Marvin made famous, won an Academy Award with it. I still thought... Rod Steiger should have gotten the Academy Award for the pawnbroker that year, but he did a very good job with fleshing out Lee Marvin's character. In 1968, Frank Pearson moved on to do the screenplay for Cool Hand Luke. And when we talk about screenwriters, we always talk about memorable lines that they put forward. So when we talk about William Goldman, you always think of Follow the Money, which he wrote for All the President's Men. It's one of the best examples of a screenwriter being associated with a specific line from a movie. And... Frank Pearson's most famous line appeared in Cool Hand Luke. It's one of the most famous lines in movies. It's spoken by Struther Martin to Cool Hand Luke, a.k.a. Paul Newman. And again, you want your many lines in movies more famous than this. And we have Frank Pearson to thank for it. Uh, what we've got here is failure to communicate. If he hadn't done anything else, Frank Pearson would have mention on this show just for that line, but he went on to do the screenplay for Dog Day Afternoon, which he won the Academy Award for, fleshing out Al Pacino's character. We did some clips from Dog Day Afternoon when we did the Sidney Lumet program last year. Pearson is also responsible for Al Pacino yelling, Attica, Attica, in Dog Day Afternoon. You know, when you write a line like that and it's not your most famous line, you're pretty good. So as I said, he won the Academy Award for that. Frank Pearson was a cultured and literate guy, and he was very well respected in Hollywood. He was alternatively the president of the Screenwriters Guild and the president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Not many people can lay claim to both of those. 
I would imagine that he's as well respected in Hollywood for one other thing. He's also famous. He was the director of the second remake of A Star is Born. That was the 1937 version with Janet Gaynor and Frederick March. The 1954 version with Judy Garland and James Mason. Well, he did the 1976 version with Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson. This was essentially Barbara at her most diva-esque. She had the final cut on the movie, which Frank Pearson didn't like, and she cut it in a way that probably lessened the movie, although it heightened her role. And Frank Pearson had to deal with all her idiosyncrasies, shall we say. And he actually wrote a famous magazine article about his experiences, in which he detailed what it was like working with Barbara and her husband, John Peters, and it's a pretty good snapshot of Hollywood. One of the interesting things in the article is that Chris Christopherson was not their first choice for the aging male lead. You know, in this version, he was written as a hard-living rock and roller on his way down. Their first choice for this sprawl was Elvis Presley. So it would have been Elvis working against Barbara Streisand. And actually, I think Elvis would have been great for the role, but Colonel Tom Parker didn't want Elvis playing a rock and roll around the way down when Elvis was indeed on the way down, although I think that had he taken that role, Elvis might have lived and it might have been the greatest role of his career. You could make a case that Colonel Tom Parker made Elvis's career and destroyed it with decisions like that. In any event, Barbara had the final cut on the movie. Barbara sort of uh, micromanaged everything. And Barbara Streisand fans think that uh, the Star is Born from 1976 is the best version, but it's not close to the 1954 version with Judy Garland. It did produce a bunch of Academy Award nominations, and in fact won Academy Award, and it was for Barbara and her song Evergreen, which she also wrote. They had a lot of great songwriting people on this. They had Leon Russell, they had Rupert Holmes, they had Paul Williams, but Barbara came out with the Academy Award for this song that she wrote and performed, and Frank Pearson's A Star Is Born. Now, soft as an easy chair. Love, fresh as the morning air. One love that is shared by two. Yeah, that was Barbara. She'd drive you crazy with all the nutball stuff she would do, and then she'd turn out a performance like that. Frank knew how to handle Barbara. They never worked together again after that, but they had a reapproachment about 20 years later. And as I said, he was one of the most cultured, literate men in Hollywood, and he maintained a certain equanimity amidst all the madness that was going on in Hollywood. Quite an interesting, fascinating, and very talented guy. In the later stages of his career, he worked a little bit on Mad Men. He also worked on The Good Wife. So for 50 years, he was associated with quality projects. And hey, not everyone in Hollywood can say that. Well, we're going to close on that note. I'd like to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And as a final tribute to Frank Pearson, I'd like to take note of the television show that actually gave him his start. He was a script editor and sometimes producer for my favorite 1950s show, Have Gun, Will Travel which starred Richard Boone as Paladin, definitely the best character in a 1950 show and arguably the best television character ever. So in tribute to Frank Pearson, we're going to play the theme from Have Gun, Will Travel, sung by Johnny Wester. This is a good one. Have Gun, Will Travel, read the card of a man. A night without armor in a savage land. His vast gun for hire needs the calling wind. A soldier of fortune is the man called Paladin.